Okay, great, guys. 56, that's fantastic. Um, welcome to the 10 o'clock session of Career Day. Um, thank you all for attending. Um, I'm going to ask you, if you would all, to uh, please uh, keep your, we're recording this session, so please keep your computers on mute. Um, and if you have any questions, um, type them into the chat and we'll come back to them um, in, in a little while. Um, I think most of you or a lot of you probably know me. Uh, my name is Michael Ice. I'm a finance professor at, at URI. Um, I teach a handful of courses. I teach uh, FIN 321. Um, I also teach the, the RAM Fund, which is the student managed fund that hopefully I'll see some of you guys in. Um, then in the graduate program, I teach a fixed income class and a security analysis class. Um, and I'm gonna assume that most of you have heard me talk enough so you don't wanna hear me talk. So I'm just gonna moderate this panel. Um, first, I would introduce uh, Lisa Lancelotta. Uh, she is our graduate program director and she will be serving as the technology assistant. Um, let's hope she doesn't have to serve a lot. Um, everything seems to be working so far, um, but Lisa will make sure we stay in, 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 on track. Um, we have three esteemed guests that again, we're so thankful um, when our alumni are, are, are anxious to come back and anxious to give back. Um, and be involved with our program. And it's a tremendous asset to our program. Um, I'm gonna let them introduce them and tell you about themselves a little bit, um, but maybe Elizabeth Demers, if you will start. Elizabeth's the Vice President at JP Morgan. If you could uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do, please. Absolutely, and good morning, everybody. And I really do like that, Professor Ice. That's actually, uh, I, we had Professor Dash, but, but Professor Rice is a pretty, pretty cool <laughs> professor <laughs> name. Um, so my name's Elizabeth Demers. I graduated from the College of Business and then went right into my MBA. Um, and I was just hearing you talk about the, the midterms. I just passed my CFP. Um, so my Congratulations. role- Thank you so much. That was um, a lot of stress, which I'm sure all of you can, can relate to. Um, some sleepless nights in early mornings and not being able to go out. Um, granted, we can't go out anyway, but um, it's that element of, of pressure. Um, but it's so incredibly rewarding, um, especially for what I'm doing now in my role. I started off, I got my MBA and then started off as an equity analyst, <clears throat> joined a private bank, joined a Bank of America private bank. And a private bank is actually a trust company that sits within the walls of a financial institution and we're regulated differently. We roll up to the OCC, Office of the Control of the Currency. So in everything we do is a fiduciary responsibility in how we talk to clients and how we invest. So started off at US Trust or actually it was Bank of America became US Trust and moved out to Chicago. I managed institutional money out there. So nonprofit, 501c3s, scholarship money, pretty interesting to sit in a client meeting where um, you determine who's, you know, the scholarship candidates and how much money is going to each one of the candidates. Moved back to Boston. Um, it was calling me back. My mother had gotten sick. Um, and I just thought I, I got sick of jumping on a plane all the time, to be perfectly honest. <clears throat> and I knew I wanted to join a couple boards, <clears throat> excuse me, in Boston and Rhode Island. And that's exactly what I did. I uh, transitioned over to TIAA, their private asset management, helped build that out upstate New York, which is, which is actually a beautiful area of the country, um, down to Rhode Island. <clears throat> and then about two years ago, joined JP Morgan Private Bank as they're expanding their footprint. Um, as you can maybe see, uh, Chase branches pop up or you're familiar with the Chase name. JP Morgan Chase is actually four pillars, asset and wealth management investment bank. So if you're familiar with Peloton at all, we IPO'd Peloton. We're also a commercial bank, commercial lending, and then consumer bank. I sit within the private bank under asset and wealth management. I also am the finance chair, the only female finance chair of an all-girls uh, Catholic school here in Rhode Island. And I also serve on the ISI, uh, ISI board, which is for pediatric oncology at Hasbro Children's Hospital. So nice to meet all of you. It's great to see all of you. Remember my time at URI and how special it is and it was and how um, much I, I truly appreciate being on the call this morning and being involved with the College of Business. Great. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll stay with ladies first. Uh, Louise Dorson uh, was a senior vice president at Citizens Financial Group 
and claims to have had every job there is in the world of uh, banking. <laughs> Almost everyone. Almost. I, I, the only one I didn't have was HR. Okay. So I got my MBA and right after I got my MBA, I, I'm an odd person on this call, frankly, because I did not get my undergraduate at URI. I came here uh, with a uh, baby six months old and said, help, help, what am I gonna do? I was in the middle of an MBA pro process in Washington, DC. And URI was very welcoming and, and offered me uh, sort of a rapid track to getting my MBA here. So I finished in Rhode Island and then uh, went for the uh, prehistoric bank called Fleet Bank and uh, started out in uh, technology and engineering actually, which is an interesting combo. Um, and then from there morphed into many, many different roles in marketing and product management and finance, uh, legal. Um, so I've been kind of all over the map. Uh, my um, joke is that I uh, can't keep a job. And so uh, every time I would have a little sense of, you know, I really know too much about this. I, I love knowing a lot about a lot of stuff. Uh, I would jump to another role uh, that was completely outside of my uh, realm. And um, I obviously along the way had to acquire lots of uh, mentors and lots of contacts outside of my role because uh, in order to segue into something else, you really need to um, talk to lots of different people, get to know different people, get to know uh, what their need is in, within a corporation and how you might be able to fit with that uh, need. So I worked uh, on the commercial banking side of the house, if you will, uh, doing um, the, the banking side of commercial banking, as well as I worked in the treasury department uh, of uh, Citizens Bank. And so um, I've kind of seen the, the realm of different banking roles, if you will. And, and frankly, finance people can fit in just about anywhere within a bank uh, because banking obviously is about finance, right? So. Uh, all of the kinds of things that you learn how to do in terms of analytical processes are well suited to whether you work in a, a finance area of a consumer bank or whether you're a product manager or whether you run the business uh, or whether you're a banker and you go out and talk to clients who may have a company of $50 billion and you need to make a presentation to a CFO. Um, so they're there are tons and tons and tons of things in finance banking uh, that you, that you when I frankly was totally naive to when I first started out. So, you know, if you don't like one piece, great, go try something else. Oh, back to you, Michael. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Louise. You know, it's interesting because you've had such a broad, broad breadth of the, of the banking world. Um, one of my criticisms always have been with Wall Street is in Wall Street, you, you end up knowing an inch wide and a mile deep, right? You end up as a specialist and for that little inch, you know it down to a mile, but then you don't know anything else around you. So you've had a, you've had a tremendous opportunity there. Um, well, I'll, just, I'll just add that uh, that's me. That, that's what my need is. It doesn't suit everybody. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, for a while, I was very happy with my inch wide and a mile deep because I had a lot to learn. Um, Ken Gambone, Director of Western Region Head of TD Securities USA. Ken? Yeah, thanks for having me. This was great to be part of um, I graduated URI in 1988, uh, way back when. Um, and I ended up going on and getting my graduate degree at um, Fordham University. Um, I went part time while I was working which was uh, quite the challenge. Um, out of URI, I was working at, I worked for two different companies for most of my career. Both of them don't exist anymore. Uh, one was Solomon Brothers, uh, which was my first job out of school. And it was uh, quite the environment to work in. I worked in the equity division of the investment bank as a trade support analyst. It was my first job out of school. Um, had a number of jobs that I really didn't care for, ended up networking my way through to the fixed income division, not expecting to want a career in fixed income, but 
ended up that that's what I really enjoyed. Um, and ended up leaving Solomon right before they got acquired by City and took a job at Lehman Brothers because I figured what could go wrong at Lehman. And that was there for about 20 years. And, you know, and then I went on and stayed on Barclays, bought my division after the fabled bankruptcy um, in 08 and um, stayed at Barclays for a number of years. And recently, about four years ago, left to really build out the TD Securities um, municipal bond banking platform across the country. And the Western Division is kind of a very broad description of uh, for TD because it basically starts in Western Pennsylvania and goes all the way to California, um, including Alaska and Hawaii. Um, so I work in the municipal bond area of a fixed income division within the investment bank. So that's a lot. But it's, it's each of us on, on this panel work in different divisions of finance at banks, basically. And it's just important to note those different areas because some of them aren't allowed to help the other and some are complementary to the other. So, you know, I'm in the investment bank. I started my career as a municipal bond trader. Um, 10 years into that, I decided I liked being in front of clients better and became an investment banker. And every trader on my trading desk told me I was going to the dark side. Why would you want to go to the dark side and be an investment banker? And everybody in investment banking said, you're coming from the dark side. Uh, so it doesn't happen often. You don't see a lot of traders become bankers and vice versa. Um, but it's just that's how my career kind of just I followed what I enjoyed doing. And I left a trail of successes along the way um, in order to kind of open those doors uh, for opportunities. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, my, my first question was going to be kind of how did you get to where you are? But I think we've kind of covered that um, a bit, guys. So thank you very much. Um, another one that the students ask me a lot is um, what tools do they need to, um, to build or work on in, 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 as an undergrad? Um, and we're, we're beginning to expand a little bit. And ultimately, we'd like to give them some more choices as they go through their finance curriculum, the, the tools and we're you know, and, and it becomes topical now because, you know, certain routes in finance are sort of a different set. And we're CFA based, so we're a little bit more sales and trading oriented. Um, but there, but many of many of our students will end up in the PFNA route. Um, I mean, we have some students taking uh, Python classes and programming classes. So if, um, I'm going to throw it out to the panel. What tools are, are you looking for? What tools can a student at URI um, build on to differentiate themselves in, in the hiring process. A little bit of a curveball, guys. I'm sorry, but anybody want to take a shot? Um, I know you all talk to new students. Uh, maybe Elizabeth, what, what, do you, what would you say to that? Uh, let's see. Probably coming off of my CFP and, and, and I'm client facing a lot, there has been so much happening with a presidential election, a CARES Act. Um, I think for me, knowing about taxes, was something that was a um, <clears throat> always something that I I wanted to do. Uh, it is so topical with clients. It's it's I know the program CFA based, and clients are concerned about their investments, but then it becomes a tax issue, and then it becomes an estate planning issue. So it really becomes more broad in the sense that how impactful you want to be as an advisor. You really have to know a couple different areas. Um, and I would say that being very familiar with taxes um, is an area that that um, I would I would probably look back and say I wish I, I wish I knew a little bit more about. And certainly with the CFP, got a lot of education, a lot of study time in. But um, to, to be able to be well versed in it and talking to clients about it is something that that's important. Elizabeth, I I, uh, I really appreciate your talking about that because I'm married to a tax attorney. Oh and, man, yeah, and he spends a lot <laughs> of his life advising people like you and the client on that very issue. So uh, very timely and very accurate, I think. Um, interestingly enough, in in uh, my last role, uh, you had to know SAS, basically speaking, or or you couldn't do the job. So um, it just so happened that all the people that uh, worked on uh, finance 
um, modeling and that sort of stuff, uh, we all use SAS. Interesting. Yeah, and I guess following on that theme um, of taxes, you know, most of the municipal bond business is built around tax exempt bonds. So a lot of the product that I am creating um, that's going to be sold on our trading desk, um, Elizabeth's customers would be buying um, if they wanted to avoid taxes. <laughs> um, so, but you know, I, I'm an investment banker, which means basically I'm a salesperson. Um, I work with municipalities and universities and hospitals around the country. So they're my clients. Um, so the analysts that we bring in have to know how to put together presentation books, um, which means there's a lot of quantitative work that goes into a, a presentation book. Some of that involves like Excel and Bloomberg and Refinitiv software. Um, some of it uses a program called DBC, which is very specific to the municipal bond world. Um, it's very technical kind of software that analyzes the way bonds are structured. Um, and we expect our analysts and associates to become proficient at it and to be able to produce work quickly, which means you have to take years to get to the point where you would be promoted from that. But it's, it's definitely a skill and it's, it's all geared toward sales at the end of the day. It's all geared toward providing updates to clients so that they, they can understand it, which means it has to be pretty clear if you're speaking to someone who's not proficient at bond math um, and being able to communicate that effectively and clearly um, and in a believable way. So to take interpersonal skills and people have to trust you at the end of the day that, that you know what you're doing because of the idea that I pitch to a municipality, they're gonna have to take to their city council or to their board um, depending on the type of entity and advocate for me and say, I think Ken's idea at TD Securities is the best idea. That's why we, I think we should do it. And then they're going to vote on it. So you have to be able to convince that finance director that, um, that they should stick their neck out for you. And that requires an element of trust. And that's something that's built over time. No, very good. Thank you, Ken. Um, Clearly, you know, the world doesn't stop, and we've all been through a kind of a challenging last year or so. Um, but even beyond that, the banking in the industry revol evolves all the time. It changes all the time. Um, can you give me any examples where um, events in your that have occurred have changed your business um, dramatically? I mean, obviously, COVID has probably affected everybody's business, but um, one of the things that I always try hard to do as a professor is stay current. Um, so I'm, I'm listening very closely on these two, but you know, the students need to hear people that are current. You guys are current. Um, so what would you say is in, impacting your business these days currently? Well, uh, in the banking business, the challenge is NIM and ex managing expense. So um, there have been industry-wide layoffs uh, in commercial banking, um, and um, so it, it has affected white-collar workers uh, dramatically, as far as uh, I've seen. And interestingly, this uh, doesn't get a lot of play in the press because it's all done sort of um, in little pods, if you will but managing expenses has become a very important factor. I've talked to lots of my friends across uh, the commercial banking industry and it's happening uh, uh, you know, system-wide where people are trying to manage down uh, their risk areas. And, and with the election, um, now people are a little worried that they're gonna have to start ramping them back up again because uh, the um, former administration uh, was a little bit less onerous in terms of uh, enforcement, but uh, given the change in administration, it remains to be seen whether that will carry forward. Okay. Um, Ken, do you want to go? You talked about to... taxes. <laughs> I guess that, that I would maybe position it from like the top down and then the bottom up. So okay. clients now, um, are very comfortable texting me on the weekends, right? They're sending me pictures of their, you know, miniature donkey that they just bought named Henry. 
Like there is a level of comfort now um, just because of technology, right? There's, um, and that's accelerated by COVID, accelerated by being home and having that comfort level. I guess from the top down, from a corporate perspective, JP Morgan, and I think there's been a bigger light that shined on it from a corporate social responsibility perspective as well, is what is JP Morgan's role in, in advancing income inequality and equality, um, as well as diversity. And I think that's really been, and, and especially for me, I find it, and I feel it's very important to work for a company that has somewhat of a, a soul, right? That they're really taking the steps needed to correct any type of past behaviors or past institution, institutionalized biases um, and, and push that forward and push through that and begin initiatives um, so that's, that's definitely been a positive. And then in terms of us as a company, <clears throat> I would have to say that we've become more of a fintech company than an actual bank. Um, in that social responsibility is banking more individuals that are unbanked, um, closing that gap in terms of inequality. And, and I think um, COVID has, has truly accelerated that. I'd have to say that. Um, I'm proud to work for a bank that is actually moving that that forward a little bit. But it's 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 always great to get a, a client uh, text message with a with a picture of a, a miniature donkey. I would have to, would have to uh, Henry. Ken thoughts. Yeah. And I think Elizabeth touches on one of the biggest trends that I see in my industry, and that's the ESG growth that's really occurring in the market right now. You know, the evolution of investment banking has just changed so dramatically in the 30 years I've been doing it. And, you know, it was much more just about the numbers. And now it, it's much more about um, the social causes. And, you know, working in the municipal bond space, I deal with a lot of, of state and local governments. So it's very politically driven where you know, you'll have a governor or a treasurer that gets elected to a state and they have certain initiatives that they want to achieve so that we'll all actually change the way we need to structure transactions. I'll give you an example. Um, for, so I work with a company called, or an entity, New York City Housing Development Corporation. They help facilitate housing in New York City, as you would imagine. They never would issue socially conscious bonds in the past um, now that all their deals are affordable housing bonds and, um, and social bonds. And, you know, all their bonds that they issue help fund a, at least a portion of the buildings that they build for low income or moderate income uh, people in New York City to help kind of meet the supply demand imbalance that's occurring currently. Now almost everything has a social label to it. And you know we're selling those bonds to funds that are ESG funds. So as those funds continue to grow in size, they have to buy more bonds that have this designation on them. Um, so that's kind of a big change and a trend that's going on right now, at least in my industry. And I think um, it's fair to say it's a you know overall within the finance industry is, is uh, moving in that direction more. Interesting. Interesting. Absolutely. I think it's before it was seen as you know profits over purpose now it's that there's more momentum of profits because of purpose um, a lot of my clients want those socially responsible uh, investments but more in terms of modernizing their portfolio certainly getting the tax benefits of a, a municipal bond but saying okay well, what good is is this bond doing as well so it's, it's definitely it's here i think it's here to stay i think it's um, that conversation we're having almost daily with with clients. Now that's interesting, and and that is a dramatic change. I would say in the last few years, from um, two or three, four years ago, where it was you know I get I, I get judged on my returns, and that's what matters. Um, and that that's good to hear, actually. Um, I think every student here is probably either looking for a job or will be looking for a job in the near future. What advice do you have them? Could you give them how to get that job? Um, what What are the? I, I I actually sympathize with the students now as technology is kind of taken over a bit. 
you know, they're interviewing into portals, right? They're, or they're, they're applying into portals and then they're interviewing into a computer that then gets saved and sent off to, to some big bank. Um, any, any thoughts, advice, direction you can give them to how do they get started? How do they get that first job? Anybody want to take a shot at that one? I'm happy to start out on that. Um, you know, you need a way to differentiate yourself. That's very difficult. I'm not saying it's easy, but you have to try to find that way. And it may be trying to connect on something on a personal level. It's pretty easy now using LinkedIn and other social media platforms to learn about the people you're interviewing with. Um, and you should be doing that. You should be trying to find out as much about the companies, the divisions, and the people because at the end of the day, the, the analysts that we hire, we hire because I think that they're going to be the next generation of managing directors speaking directly to clients. And frankly, the, you know, one of the shortcomings I think it from that I've seen over time is we bring in a lot of very highly qualified from a quantitative standpoint, um, students from Ivy League schools that, you know, graduated top of their class, excellent quantitatively. Socially, not as much so. I do not see them dealing with clients. I do not see them being effective with a the client. They'll, they'll produce great work, though. Um, so, you know, I think um, graduate from URI, a way to position yourself is, is really taking kind of more of the interpersonal approach to that and saying, I can do the quantitative piece, and I'm also going to be the guy that's going to connect with your client. They're going to love me after they get to know me. Any other thoughts, panel? I know we have a, a three-year analyst um, <clears throat> program, and that's almost like a, I liken it to a, like a residency rotation where they're, the analysts are put through different areas of the bank to see what's, what's a good fit, whether it's investment bank, private bank, JP Morgan Securities. Um, so I definitely, if, if uh, you know, looking into that type of program. I've also worked for TIAA and uh, Bank of America Private Bank. So just starting off as, as seeing um, what, is, what is out there. We've reduced the number of analysts for this coming summer. So we've definitely pulled back a little bit, but given the growth of JP Morgan, I think that's going to ramp back up. So just be open to the fact that there are analyst positions. I don't know. I think there's one of the questions forecast for recruitment for finance companies a year from now uh, from Aaron. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's an unknown, but I think when you think about the growth, growth projection of fintech companies, I think where you see, that's where you see some opportunities there and certainly for hiring. Um, you know, as the economy starts to, to emerge from this, as we, we start to see some growth, I think you're also going to see growth in hiring as well. And I think that's where you see the opportunity. Um, so, so I just wanna, wanna put that out there. Uh, what, give me an idea, the students always, they do like to hear stories and current stories. Um, do, do you have a thought of, you know, some experience that, that happened in your work in your job that impacted you either as a person or you in in your job because um, things happen all the time right and and sometimes they you, you spin them into a very big positive and sometimes you know they're they're a setback um, but things happen um the, you know, your 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 work day isn't as scheduled as maybe some people think anybody got a good story they can share with the student i'll share one Sure. So I was uh, going to give a presentation to the CEO and one level down group. And um, I kept getting 15 minutes before I was supposed to make this presentation. Uh, I kept getting a phone call on my cell phone and I didn't recognize the number. So I ignored it and I ignored it. And finally, uh, about 10 minutes to go, I picked it up because this person was incessantly calling me. And it turned out that it was somebody telling me that one of my family members had been rushed to the hospital and I need to uh, go to Rhode Island Hospital right now. Well, I happened to be giving the presentation in Boston, uh, but I you know, called the person that was uh, setting up the room and I said, you know, I have to apologize, but we have to, 
I can't make the presentation. I have to go right now. And in my younger years, I don't think I would have left. That's the scary thing. I think I would have said, no, I have to make this presentation. It's the most important thing. And, um, but I was at this point in my career life secure enough to say, I can schedule, you know, cancel a meeting with the CEO and his directs uh, because uh, there is a family crisis and I need to be there. And I'm very glad I did and everything worked out fine. And I gave the presentation later. So all I'm saying is give yourselves permission to deal with things as they come along and don't be a crazy person like I was in my youth where I went back to work after six weeks, for example, with my children because I felt like I just had to produce, produce, produce or nobody was gonna take me seriously. Very good, anyone else? Uh, I guess I'll go. I'm going to try and answer some of Brian's question in addition to Derek's, in addition to yours. Okay. Um, <laughs> what, so what I, you know, when you, when you work in a team, when you work in a group, you kind of feed off the energy of, of, of each other. And I think you've, you've found that going through the College of Business. It's very similar <clears throat> when you're in a work environment, you have to be uh, trusting and have faith in, in your manager to, to be on your side, um, to fight for you when, when you need somebody in your corner. And I think that is where you find value and, and where you find purpose um, in, in doing your everyday job and really, really enjoying it. I love the client relationship aspect, but I'm so completely supported by my team. And that's one of the parts that I like most about my job. The, and I've been insulted before. I've been taught, you know, the, said the worst things to me. I've been it, just so incredibly uncomfortable, but moving through that, talking to my manager about it has been, um, you develop more of a trust with your with your teammates and I would have to say that's been one of the, the the learning experiences that I've had for the first time I've had a fire client um, who've moved to um, Seoul Korea we can't do um, uh, we can't operate within outside of, of JP Morgan the United States um, in Korea so that was my first time ever having that type of difficult conversation. Um, it is relying on my manager and teammates to, to strategize around that, to, to kind of say what is the best approach to, to handling this in a professional way, getting that type of feedback, getting that type of encouragement, um, and not encouragement to, to fire anybody or any client, but just the encouragement to say, okay, we're in this together, we're moving this dial forward together, and I'm here to support you is extraordinarily important for me. So I'd have to, I'd have to say that um, it's it not, it's, it's not always going to be, you know, a, a great client uh, experience and not going to be an easy journey, but there's definitely the support of, of your teammates that, that, that encourage you and keep you going. Well, thank you. Um, Ken, I'm going to direct this to you because the, the kids have, have ban bantered me with it and it's not my expertise. Um, but talk to me a little bit about, give me your spin on GameStop and Robinhood um, and the whole issues that have surrounded that. I'm sure it's, it's got to be right in front of you guys, whether you like well, it or not, uh, right? A little bit. Um, you know, within the investment bank, within um, sales and trading, it, it, it impacts it. But um, I work in a fixed income division. So. Right, that's true. Rarely do I end up speaking to anyone who works in equities. Um, <laughs> okay, it's the equivalent of you know the you know the bond market is like a credit card that you would use, you know, and it's usually the first place that, that borrowers want to access. People want to borrow money without giving up equity, so the equity market is usually kind of the last thing that you get to, and that's why you see a lot of these tech companies, you know, they'll wait to the very end and then they cash out with the big equity offering, and hopefully it goes through the roof. Um, so my, my personal experience or professional experience, I should say, is, is really just in the fixed income aspect of that. And, you know, that doesn't touch on like Robin Hood or GameStop. I mean, I, I follow that stuff, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a great lesson in, in supply and demand 
of how markets work. You know, I talk to my kids all the time about financial markets, and they see these things and they ask all the same questions you guys are probably asking. And I like to just continue to tell them that markets are based on perception. They're not based on numbers. You go to class and you learn a lot about numbers and what valuation is, what's a growth stock and a value stock. But at the end of the day, it's all about perception. If people perceive something is worth more, they're going to invest in it. And that means there's more buyers than sellers. And that's why a stock goes up in price. No, good, good answer. And I, behavioral finance is, is become a, a, a very topical um, area. And I put it into my class this, the last couple of semesters. Um, so I, 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 I agree with you 100%. Um, Elizabeth, did you did your clients want to talk about GameStop and um, et cetera? Or do your clients just aren't going to? Oh, yeah. I mean, and we've had every single, every morning we have an 8 a.m. investment call. So that was, you know, obviously... Um, the subject du jour uh, at every at every meeting, because when you think about it, it's not so much truly GameStop. It is why a hedge fund is shorting a stock that was already trading at three four dollars a share, right? <laughs> right. So it's unlimited liability on the part of the hedge fund, and they came in and they stopped, you know, stopped the trading. So there was, you know, you really. We have to look at all aspects of it, of why there was such a, uh, you know, the, the increase in the stock price, but truly why, why were this, this particular hedge fund unregulated unreg enough to be shorting those types of those companies that were already trading at a deep, deep discount. So it was, you know, it was, clients like to talk about it because it, because it's such an, it was such an anomaly, right? Yeah. But that's not how we invest. That's not how we're looking at their long-term, you know, estate planning, their long-term asset allocation, how they're invested, their global diversity. Um, it doesn't rest on one individual stock, but certainly as we're, you know, you're talking to a client, you get a sense of what they think about in terms of risk, right? right. How they understand or how they perceive the stock market. What does that mean overall for their total wealth picture? And really, more often than not, they weren't invested in GameStop, or some clients had been invested in it for the last 20 years and never made money, <laughs> never made money on it till now. And now they have more of a tax issue than anything else, right? <laughs> so it definitely was a conversation we had every single morning. Now it's more of like Bitcoin and crypto. Uh, we have a next gen vehicle fund coming out. We have a sustainable equity strategy, but it really, you have to say current with these kind of things because that's what clients are reading about. That's what clients are seeing. That's what's happening. And to your point, Professor Ice, um, that you have to stay in front of it because clients are looking at it, right? And they, they want to talk about it. Has Mr. Diamond changed his opinion on cryptocurrency at all? He, he, apparently, he apparently has if we're rolling out rolling out of funds <laughs> on it. Yeah, he, he did he did take a shift on on that one. All right. Now now, now we want to hear from the students a little bit. I'm, the the grown-ups are done talking. So um, Lisa, how's the best way to bring the students in? And sure. I, I'll go as far as I'd like to see the students when they ask a question. Yep, absolutely. So camera. I'm gonna just go in order as far as who asked the first question. Um, so first we'll have Brian Ellis. Um, Brian, if your, your picture's already on, so that's wonderful. If you just wanna unmute yourself and maybe ask your question. Sure, thank you. Um, my first question, uh, what do you like most about your job? Elizabeth, thank you, you already answered it a little bit, but I'm interested to hear from Louise and Ken. Um, what's, what do you like most about your job? Ken, do you want to go first? Um, sure. Um, I, I like dealing with clients. I like working with power companies and water districts and governments around the country and seeing real shovel in the ground type projects. Every other area of finance is like funny money in a sense. You don't really see the project being built. I work in a very tangible piece of finance where, you know, they're, I'm building bridges and tunnels and schools and you know, highways and broadband and electric car charging stations and wave technology and bullet trains and, you know, all kinds of projects that 
you can look, feel, see, and touch. And it's exciting, you know, when something like that goes online and, you know, you feel like you were part of that, with the financing piece of it and working with that municipality, that gives me a sense of satisfaction, sense of, you know, I feel like I'm doing good. And at the same time, I'm making money um, to, you know, earn my paycheck on a week in, week out basis. So that's kind of very short and sweet, but it's what I like most about my job. What gets me excited every morning to get up and go to work. And I will uh, say that um, I identify with what Ken said when I was a commercial in commercial banking. Uh, it certainly was fun to talk to clients and and help them to realize their dreams of whatever it was. Um, but what I most like about banking, frankly, is the fact that it has such a broad range of things uh, where you can find your passion. And uh, if one thing you felt like you um, have uh, done enough on that line, you can go find something else to do. It, the realm is huge. And I love the intellectual um, game, if you will, uh, and always learning new things. That's been my uh, career uh, and it continues to be. So learn, learn, learn is my motto. Thank you. Sounds like really helping the world turn. Um, <laughs> what kinds of decisions do you usually make when dealing with stuff or all these big projects? Um, that was more directed towards uh, Ken and Louise. Um, you know, the, the clients that I, I cover, they're close. Um, I support me. I'm listening to every piece of information I can get, whether it's written in the newspaper, I'm listening to what the treasurer of the state is saying, um, looking at local politics that could drive a project to be built or not. Um, you know, like high-speed rail in California is a very controversial topic. It sounds like something that everybody should be doing. Um, it sounds like a pretty cool projects overall. Um, but it's extremely expensive and it's going to be more expensive than flying. So in some ways it doesn't make any sense, but you know, they're multi-billion dollar projects that are being done and I'm trying to find a way to be meaningful to my client. And that means I got to stay right on the cutting edge of that. And then my junior team is going to take direction from me on that. So what, anal what kind of analysis do I need to do um, when the treasurer of a state says, they need to borrow a billion dollars in the next year. So and I have to come up with ideas to show them what that could look like. And then I'll come up with, I'll take a shot in the dark sometimes and just send in analysis and then engage them in a discussion. Oh, well, we don't really need a billion the first year. We need 500 million and, you know, we need it over this time period. And so it's, you know, it spurs discussion. And that's what I'm always trying to do is get engaged in that discussion so that I can be, become a meaningful part of it and that will result in me ultimately getting hired. All right, thank you, thank you. Um, Lisa, another, another questions? Sure, absolutely. Um, next on the list is Aaron. Aaron, if you wanna turn on your camera and then unmute yourself and feel free to ask your question. Hi, how are you? Um, so my question is, um, what is your forecast of recruitment for finance companies a year from now? And um, Elizabeth kind of already answered me earlier, but um, I was hoping Ken and Louise could uh, give me some tips, yeah. So I, I concur with a lot of what Elizabeth had to say in terms of FinTech. Um, I do have friends who left commercial banking and went to work in FinTech. And um, those uh, companies like, for example, PayPal and whatnot um, are churning right along and are, you know, there are many startups that are uh, trying to find niches because there are lots of things that commercial banks don't want to do anymore, as well as wealth management companies, et cetera, et cetera. And um, that's really a burgeoning uh, industry. And so if you can, uh, we were talking before a little bit about differentiating yourself. If you can learn a little bit of uh, what kinds of needs they have, um, I think that would be a really great career path for uh, anybody who's interested in that type of business? Yeah, we hire a lot of summer interns 
and they get rotated. And I think those are great programs. I wish I did something like that when I was an undergrad, um, you know, usually sophomore, junior year, and they're going through rotations of different departments and that, that's all good. And very often we'll make full-time offers to those candidates. Sometimes it's hard to get part of, like we don't recruit from URI. That doesn't mean that you can't find a job at TD Securities. Um, you just have to find a, a more creative way of getting involved there. And sometimes that means finding an advocate like, like me, <laughs> um, finding somebody you can connect with and, um, and work toward. So like, I'm happy to put resumes forward for candidates that approach me in different ways. Um, also trying to find ways through, like I, I always like to say that these tangential kind of businesses that touch my business, like the rating agencies. So like Moody's, S&P and Fitch do really good jobs with credit training. And so that kind of skill set is really good in the commercial banking side to have, as well as the investment banking side. We recruit people to be vice presidents. So that's skipping the, the traditional analyst associate kind of promotion and going right to VP out of the rating agencies. The real stars get recruited by investment banks out of there for a number of reasons, but I think they do a great job. I know sometimes rating agencies don't sound like it's the greatest job. If, if you were really hoping to be in sales and trading and you end up at, a, at Moody's, but you should realize that, you know, those are really valued positions and a valued skill set to have. And again, those stars that work at those places, all of them get recruited out of, um, out of those jobs. So thank you. Um, I think Derek, you have a question. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, my question was just um, how comparable is the real world with college, with group work, collaborating, collaborating with your coworkers and, stuff like that. Cause here in college, we have a lot of um, group projects and work together after class or whatever it is studying and stuff like that. So um, I just wanted to know how comparable is that with the real world? Is that still like a thing that, um, you know, adult adults do or, or no? <laughs> it, to me, that, that, that's all it is. I mean, no matter what role I've had in the industry, it's all about the team, right? No man is an Island and it's, it, so every single thing that one does, it is about getting help, guidance, input from not only the client side, but also from uh, your colleagues within the organization, as well as industry groups. Um, so, uh, you know, as I sort of was saying at the very beginning, it's really important to have a wide network, uh, particularly as you rise up in a company so that you can reach out to all sorts of different people, whether they be attorneys or um, uh, tax experts or whatever it is. And I'd have to echo that because um, that's exactly what we're, I'm doing now is coordination among tax advisors and estate planning attorneys and working together as a team for the benefit of a client, right? So you're always gonna find that. And I probably would have to say that the most difficult people that you work with are those people that you'll learn the most from, right? That sometimes it's a, a you know, you're white knuckling it, right? You're like, um, man, um, I have to work with this person again. But um, you learn, right? And you learn how to be a better advisor. You learn how to be a better teammate. You learn how to be a better steward of capital, right? By, by relying on the strengths of yourself, but also on your teammates as well. Yeah, and Derek, it, it can't be emphasized enough how important that really is in the real world um, to find um, the stars that can do their job really well but can create synergies within their department, they're the ones that become the senior managers over time. There's not one senior manager that works anywhere in finance that doesn't know how to get the most out of their team. And that means they have to collaborate with other departments and other people, and they bring the whole firm to, to work for the client. Thank you. Hey, Lisa, what's our timing? Are we good to 11? Yes, we're good to 11. So we have about a little less than 10 minutes left. 
Okay. Um, so the next question is going to come from Guy Rizzo. Guy, if you want to unmute yourself and ask away. Yeah, sure. Hi. Um, I just had a, like a more general current of like events question. I, um, how great of an impact will the stimulus have on inflation expectations? And do you believe the Federal Reserve will reverse these easy money policies sooner than expected? Ken, you want to, we can maybe tackle it together. Um, sure, I'm happy to start out. So, you know, I'll, I'll use the crutch of my economists, which are always right, of course. Um, that's the beauty. <laughs> Eventually they're right. <laughs> they're like, uh, um, so our, our forecast is for, you know, interest rates aren't going to change for the, for the next year and a half at least. So the near term forecast is that rates are just going to stay low. So the second part of your question, <laughs> how that's going to impact inflation, is becomes a little bit more of a personal kind of take on that. Um, I think that it, it is going to impact that. Yeah, I think you will see more inflation start creeping in in different ways. Um, one of the things I'm seeing in my industry that is kind of interesting is we're seeing more forward delivery trades being done, which means that municipalities are issuing bonds today that won't settle for a year from now. So they're not going to settle till next year. So if you're a buy side client and you just, I just created a, a security that Elizabeth sold to one of her clients, they don't have to, have to pay for it for a year. That's unheard of in, in the bond world. It, it, it's very, not heard of very often. And there've been two transactions that were done just this week with a full year forward settlement. So that's telling me that municipalities are saying rates are low, but they're going to go up. So I want to issue today and lock it in. And, you know, how much penalty do I pay for that And is the question. So, you know, in, in these two cases, it was under 50 basis points for a whole full year forward. So kind of just a way to think about it. it wow. You know, well, let me turn it over to Elizabeth and see if she has. No, that's any great, other Ken. That's really interesting, too. Um, so I, I think. In, in relying on our economists as well. Sometimes we, th we can think of like inflation as this like bad thing, right? And, and obviously hyperinflation is terrible, but inflation is actually, you know, it means that, and as rates are moving higher, it means that the economy is somewhat on stable footing, right? And it's almost like buying clothes for, I have two nephews that are 13 and 15. I buy them clothes that, you know, for 15 and 17 year olds, so they, they can grow into them. And I think that's what we have to think of when we think about inflation, that we're, where the economy is now and that inflation expectation, we're growing into that. And that's a good sign, right? That there's a pulse to the economy. Um, the inflation, when you think of like, like hyperinflation, it's almost like a buy it now because next week the price is going to go higher. That's more of like your, your third world countries. But when you think about inflation now, that's a good growth indicator too, right? Buy it now because eventually prices are going to go up. Um, and, and that just is, is our indication that we have some room to grow within this economy. So it's Great, a good thing. Thank you. Ken, I've never heard of such a thing. Um, that is bizarre <laughs> for the forward settlement. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Patrick, I'm not ignoring you. I think you we've kind of answered your question a little bit. Um, how about Michael Sigler? Michael, would you like to turn your camera on or unmute, please? Uh, sure. Uh, my question was, uh, how do you get ahead of your competitors and adapt to the changes in your industry? Uh, maybe I can I can take that only because it's we we had a call on it yesterday. Um, and I won't do it specifically to the private bank, but you think about fintech, think about it in relation to the $1,400 stimulus checks that went out, the cost of processing, and, and most people got them as direct deposit, but um, a good majority of American or a good amount of Americans got them as physical checks. It costs $60 million to process those checks. I mean, that's not income equality whatsoever. That is, <laughs> that is unbelievable. Right, and you think of the amount of people that are unbanked in this country, and 1.7 billion in the world. It creates this um, impetus for growth, and especially with fintech companies or those neo type of of, of uh, financial services companies like Robinhood. 
so it's happening. That technology is here and that's how that competitive environment is fostered, right? Is there, there's a need, there's a growth. You think about the MSCI world over the next five years, probably growing at about 20%. FinTech companies are expected to grow at double that. So that pace of change, that technology is, is happening now. Um, and, and you see it every single day um, in, the, in the industry, and that's how there's, you know, adaption and adoption to it. Anyone else want, on the panel want to comment to that or? Good, then I want to go back to Elizabeth before we finish the, the panel. Elizabeth, how did J.P. Morgan Chase finally find R Rhode Island? What, give, me the, give me your spin. <laughs> um, so I was, so never, never, um, discount your, your relationships. Right. And I think professor ice, I mean, you know, it, and you probably speak to, to your, your students about it. Your network is so critically important. When I was at TIAA, I said, okay, I've, you, you get to a point in your career where it's like, okay, I want to, I want to grow into another position. I want to expand my knowledge base. Um, and my colleague from years before was with JP Morgan and he said, you know what, we'd, we'd love to have you, we'd love to have your skill set. Um, and that's how I was recruited over to JP Morgan. Um, I would also have to say that that having that strong, staying in touch with, you know, your, your network and, and making sure those lines of communication are always open um, was how I, I, I landed at JP Morgan. Um, I also serve on, on two boards. I love volunteering. My rule, my, um, when I agreed to move over to JP Morgan, I said, I want to volunteer one day a week. And, and the Izzy Foundation is, is extremely important to me. Um, will you be willing to support it? And they were. So it wasn't, it was, it was both, right? It was a fit for JP Morgan, I'd like to say, and it, it was a fit for me. And I think that's when I look back on my, my career, some things weren't a fit and you move away from them or you move, you, you grow out of them. Um, and some, some positions are, you know, they fit, they feel good. So I think that's my long winded way of saying I, I do like working for my company. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, guys, I think I'm, they're gonna cut me off here at 11. You've got a full day ahead of you. Um, if you could check the chat, um, uh, Mr. Lancelot has put some um, requirements for you guys to do. If you could please follow up on those, I'd appreciate it. Um, I'd like to thank, again, I'd like to thank our panel for taking the time out of their busy day to spend with us. Um, uh, I know the students absolutely love it. Um, they love to, to meet the people that are actually in the business and, and current. Um, I think for the panel, I hope you enjoyed um, spending some time with our students. Um, we'd love to invite you back. And, and again, if I can open it up to the students and the panel to say, if you guys want to communicate and network, um, I think that's a great, great thing to do. But again, panel, thank you so much. Uh, Lisa, thanks for getting us through the tech side of this. And I hope you guys have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Look for me on LinkedIn. I'll be connecting.